Hello, Plant Science 330. Um, I just wanted to provide you guys a little bit of a background about uh, my upbringing and um, some of the research that I have been a part of relative to range science. So you have a little bit of understanding of um, of my experiences, and because I'll be bringing those to the classroom quite often. So um, first of all, I'm very very excited that you guys um, are um, taking the range class, and as soon as I get back from Utah. Um, we will have lots to talk about. So these are um, a really good set of um, range meetings that are um, being dramatically changed by the day right now just because of the new um, political policies being put into place. All right, so here's a little bit about me. Um, this is my hometown, and uh, I live um, or was born and raised about three hours northeast of Chico in a little town called MacArthur. And it was really unique. Um, out of our front window, this is not quite it, but it's close. You can actually see Mount Shasta to the west, and you can see Lassen, uh, or Mount Lassen to the south. So I was very, infor very fortunate to be able to be raised in um, the mountains. The town is very small. 500 people, and my graduating class was actually only 42 people, so, you know, really, really super big. Um, I spent my um, clear up through graduating high school um, in MacArthur, so was involved in 4-H and FFA, lots um, and lots of um, junior and high school rodeos. Um, because we were a small school, we all played sports and every sport. Um, and was involved in um, a ton of other activities such as Student Council, um, Future Bus Business Leaders of America, all of that um, good stuff as well. So I was raised on a small cow-calf operation um, that um, specialized in um, in uh, Angus and Hereford cattle. I actually showed uh, Hereford cattle growing up through the 4-H and FFA programs. And then we also have a custom trucking business um, that my mom and my dad run, um, as well as a haying and farming operation. So these are just a, some cool pictures. Um, so not only look at the very cute cows, and yes, they're Hereford, so they're amazing, um, and they're cute little babies, but also um, start to take notice of what they're actually grazing and eating. So this area, this is um, one of our home ranches, and <clears throat> um, it's on the um, on the crux of the of the um, Great Basin and mountain grasslands. So you actually see a combination of annual grasses here in the foreground, which is unique to California's Mediterranean climate. And then you also see some things that are unique to the Great Basin high desert regions, like these juniper trees back here. Here's another picture of um, our summer ground. So this is a summer lease that we have. And this is about 15 miles east of our home branch, which I just showed you. And this um, goes up in elevation by about 1,000 feet. And you're 100% in the Great Basin at this point in time. So the Great Basin area um, tends to have a lot less precipitation. Um, and so that changes the ability of that soil to actually produce different types of vegetation. So not only do we have a pretty fat um, crossbred cow right here and a cute calf, um, but we also have sagebrush here in the foreground. And if you look um, actually down at the bottom here, you can see this really kind of yellowish green plant. That's actually a toxic plant. That's loco weed um, or snake weed. The cows really don't like to eat it, so we don't have too much voluntary toxicity. And then in the back, as we start up in the hill, you can see juniper trees. And juniper trees in the Great Basin are invasive, um, so we actually manage these little um, smaller juniper trees quite often. <clears throat> and during the winter months, we actually will ship our cows and um, to after after we wean the calves off of them, we'll ship them to around the redding area, and um, we graze in the foothills during the winter and the spring. And and it, the climate is completely different. So here um, we're um, in true California um, annual grasslands, which is a really unique ecosystem that doesn't happen anywhere else in the U.S. The only other place that you'll see this Mediterranean climate is around the Mediterranean Sea, so southern France. Um, 
northern Saudi Arabia, northern Israel, those type of areas. So here we see um, some chaparral country, and chaparral is where you get a combination of woody plants, so oak trees, and then annual grasses. So after graduating high school, I went to junior college in Susanville, where I judged on the livestock judging team, and then transferred to Chico State. Yes, I'm alumni. Um, I uh, worked at both the dairy and the beef units, <clears throat> and uh, ended up graduating with an option in animal science in uh, 2005. So after that, I spent a year um, and a half actually doing research at Chico State with Dr. Dave Daly before I made the transition to New Mexico State. So New Mexico State is in Las Cruces, which is 50 miles north of the city of El Paso and Juarez and City in Mexico. Um, I earned my animal science degree, um, in, or my master's in animal science in 2009, and then stayed on and did a PhD at the same institution. Um, and it focused mostly on molecular biology and genetics and reproductive physiology. So in addition to that, I spent a lot of time with the range um, folks at New Mexico State and helped them with cattle management, also helped them with a lot of research. Um, and now I'm uh, very proudly being able to um, co collaborate with them on some research um, the last couple of years. So again, this is some of the country that I come from. Um, same picture that we just saw before, Mediterranean climate, um, annual grasses. And then this is uh, some of the rangeland that I was exposed to in New Mexico. So this is a hot desert, Chihuahuan Desert, and you can see that the topography is completely different. We only have a few mountains in the background here. And then this was a very dry year, um, so you see a lot of bare ground in the foreground. And over kind of mid-ground, you can kind of see some grasses. Um, and then we have a lot of shrubs there in Las Cruces as well. So this is a mesquite bush, and it actually produces a seed pod that the cows will eat, um, but those aren't produced until July when the rainy season comes. So I've been exposed to a lot of different areas um, and a lot of different types of rangeland, and the best part about it is that each piece of rangeland has to be managed differently. So again, another... Um, picture of the college ranch in Las Cruces. These cattle here are standing in the middle of these beautiful yellow flowers that are actually toxic. That's snakeweed. So that's why they aren't grazed because the cattle, cattle don't like them very much. And these cattle look probably a little different than cattle you'll see here in California. They are Brangus, which means that they are a crossbreed between our true Angus cattle and Brahmins. One more example of the high, or the hot desert, this is also um, the Chihuahuan Desert. You can see here in the foreground that we have these little puffs of grasses. These are called bunch grasses. And the way that they um, deal with environmental stresses is completely different than our annual grasses. And we also have fun cacti-related plants in the desert. Um, so this is a yucca plant, and it actually gets... You can kind of see it right here, this really tall pod that produces a beautiful white flower that's really high in protein. The cows actually flock to it and they come up with really unique ways to harvest those flowers. Some of the research that I do um, on the range side with, um, with, is with grazing distribution. So this is a cow that we collared with a GPS unit. So that's the collar that's around her neck and we wrap it with pink duct tape so if it does come off we don't lose it out in the middle of the range and we actually have the ability to track where these cows go um, so they can um, we I like to look at um, how cows interact with one another how much distance they um, will actually travel away from water how much time they spend at water because all that plays into how we man or how we manage our rangeland all right, so this cow was on a, uh, a ranch in Wilcox, Arizona as part of a research project, and she actually um, was one of the cows that would always hike to the very top of this very steep hill 
to eat. And so that's one of the premise of the research that I'm involved with is we want to find the cows that will travel to the top and better utilize rangeland and not the lazy ones that stay at the bottom and just eat around riparian areas. All right, so again, we're going to um, look at those different phenotypes. We call them hill climbers or bottom dwellers. And we're really looking for cattle that we can continue to prolificate in our herd that are going to climb these really, really steep pastures. So we can, the other part about that is that we can spend um, quite a bit of time looking at movement patterns just from GPS collar locations. So we can see if cows are actually using this low ground like this red cow here or this high ground like these blue cows here. Um, or hanging out in the very, very bottom, bottom ground like this purple cow over here. And um, the other part of my life is I'm a uh, geneticist by training, so I like to take all these traits that we measure on rangeland and be able to compare them back to that animal's DNA. And that'll give us some idea of how that animal adapts to different, uh, different environments. So my motivation for getting involved in range, pro range production and range research is um, to, a lot of it is for not only to do a better job as a rancher, but to also um, help prevent wildfire. So I truly believe that cattle are and other domestic species of livestock could be used in a more beneficial fashion to help um, manage um, a lot of our national forests. So another picture of fire, very scary. This was actually on my cousin's ranch. This was part of the Eiler fire in 2014 up around the Hat Creek area. And um, this was not only the Eiler fire, but um, a second fire that started not very far away from it. Same time, same week, these two massive wildfires were burning within um, close proximity to one another. So I, I, I have lots and lots of motivation for wanting to be involved with range science and management. There's another picture. Um, getting pretty close. So this is actually row crops. This is wheat um, in, in front of the, of the fires here. Very scary. All right, so and I also do quite a bit of research not in um, looking at the interaction of ruminant nutrition, range management, range science, grazing distribution, as well as reproduction. So if you ever see any folks that work in my lab, they're probably on some sort of research project doing um, some additional work in addition to just going to school to get your degree. So if you guys are interested, please come and let me know and so you can get involved. There's some more pictures. Us doing forage management in Lassen, uh, the Lassen National Forest. And we also get to do quite a bit of tours. Last year, we got to go to the Kings, uh, Kings Ranch in Kingsville, Texas um, during the uh, range management meetings, which is where I'm at this week in Utah. And um, at those meetings, we actually take a couple of competitive teams. And last year, in 2016, we were fortunate enough to have the champion Rangeland Cup team and the fourth place Rangeland Cup team. So our students do very well in these type of um, situations. And they had multiple offers for grad school and jobs. So get involved is the best advice I can give you. All right. And lots and lots of field trips and tours we tend to do. And I'm going to incorporate some of that into our class this semester as well. So, oh, aren't they cute? Alrighty, so that's a little bit about my background, and we will see you guys next Thursday in class.